All right, welcome back everyone to the last Morse lecture of this year. Simone will tell us about scalar cur curvature of Digby of polytopes. Thank you. Yeah, in today's lecture, I want to discuss the theory of problems in the theory of scalar curvature. And I would like to begin by reviewing some of the landmark results in the subject. So the, the first one is the positive thrust form. And so here I just, I'm just stating a special case of that. So we're looking at a metric G on Euclidean space with non-negative scalar curvature. And we assume that near infinity, the metric is Euclidean up to some error terms that fall off faster than R to the two minus N. And you need to impose some conditions on the decay of the derivatives of the metric as well. And under that condition, it follows that the metric is actually flat. So the, the metric is completely rigid. And so this was proved by Shane and Yao, or initially in dimension three, using minimal hypersurfaces. And then the proof was extended by uh, Shane and Yao up to dimension seven. And there's a completely different proof by Witten, which works in all dimensions. Um, another landmark result in the theory of scalar curvature, which is related to the positive mass term, is um, this term by Gromov and Larson and Ben Yao, which says that if you have a metric on the n-dimensional torus, which has no negative scalar curvature, then this metric G has to be flat. So, this, so you have another rigidity property, but this time in a compact setting um, on the n-dimensional torus. Again, there are two proofs of that result. So one uses minimal hypersurfaces and is due to Shane and Yao and works up to dimension seven. And there's a second proof due to Gromov and Larson, which uses spinners and which works in any dimension. So in both of these results, what you're really doing is you compare um, a metric to a model metric. And in the first case, the black Euclidean metric. In the second case, the black metric on the torus. And then you, you make a, an assumption concerning the sign of the scalar curvature. Now, the, the, these results are very subtle because scalar curvature, among all the invariants considered in geometry, is the weakest one. So there are results, many results in geometry about manifolds with lower curvature bounds, and you can make assumptions about sectional curvature or about Ricci curvature, but ass assumptions on the scalar curvature are much weaker, and that makes um, these types of questions subtle because there are very few techniques available that you can bring to bear on these types of problems. Um, let me also tell you about a result where we compare to a metric with positive scalar curvature. So in the first two results, we assume the scalar curvature is non-negative. Now let's assume we have a metric on Sn, the standard sphere, and let's assume a lower curvature bound. Let's assume the scalar curvature is at least n times n minus one. Then we want to conclude that this metric has to be rigid and has to be the standard. Now, without any extra assumptions, this is not true. We could simply scale down the metric and then make this, the curvature as large as you want. But Laurel noticed that you can make the problem rigid if you assume that the metric G is greater than the standard metric on the sphere SN. So put another way, um, if you set it up like this, then the identity map from the sphere equipped with the metric G to the sphere equipped with its standard metric, this should be distance decreasing, should decrease length of, lengths of curves. Actually, it's enough to assume that it decreases two-dimensional area, and that gives you a slightly more general result. Now, this, this book by Laurel, this, is, this again uses spinners, and it's in the spirit of the earlier argument of Gromov and Larson. And 
So in, in all of these results, the techniques fall broadly into, um, I mean, two different types of techniques. And so one is the, the minimal hypersurface mm -hmm. approach in dimension three, and then in higher dimensions, you, you have to use minimal slicings, where in each, where you look at minimal hypersurfaces within minimal hypersurfaces, and this is the technique of Shane and Yao. And then the second basic type of technique that can exploit assumptions and scalar curvature is the Dirac operator technique. Okay, so, so this is just an overview of the background and of some of my favorite results in this field. Um, now, let me tell you about a conjecture of Gromov. So Gromov was looking for an analog of the Toponogov comparison form for manifolds with lower bounds and sectional curvature. And so the backstory is that if you have a manifold with positive sectional curvature, then um, this property of positivity of sectional curvature, that is reflected by the behavior of triangles. So you have like in the law of cosines, you get an inequality, and you can compare a triangle in your manifold to a comparison triangle in a manifold um, in, in Euclidean space, let's say, and then you get certain inequalities between the original triangle in M and the comparison triangle in Euclidean space. And so one of realized that you can do something similar from manifolds with positive scalar curvature, but you should replace triangles by polytopes. So you would look at a metric, let's say, on a polytope in Rn, so we have a, a standard polytope, but we put a, a metric on it, which is not Euclidean. But then, and then we assume that the scalar curvature is in a negative inside the polytope. And the idea is that we want to compare this polytope with the curved metric G to a black polytope, just as in Toponogov's form, you compare a geodesic triangle in a curved manifold to a standard triangle in Euclidean space. And so then just as in Toponogov's form, you assume that the faces of the triangle, excuse me, that the edges of the triangle are geodesics. Um, in Gromov's conjecture, you assume that the boundary faces of the polytope either have zero mean curvature or have positive mean curvature. So they are mean convex with respect to this metric G. And then just as in Toponogov's form, you have an assumption on the angles. Um, here in Gromov's conjecture, um, you make an assumption that the angles computed with respect to G are smaller, that is to say, more acute than the corresponding angles with respect to the Euclidean metric. So you can compute the angles in, with respect to either metric. You can compute them with respect to the Riemannian metric G or with respect to the Euclidean metric. And then you want to assume this inequality. Right, and so then under all these assumptions, the conclusion is that, well, this shouldn't matter unless, this shouldn't happen unless G is flat and the boundary faces are totally geodesic and you get equality of the angles. So you, you expect rigidity in this case. Now this problem has, um, has been studied by many authors and a number of partial results have been obtained. The first partial result on this conjecture was proved by Gromov himself, and he verified the conjecture for cubes. Then um, in an important paper, Zhao Li proved it for prisms in 3D, and he was also able to check verify the conjecture for higher dimensional prisms, but he had to assume equality of the angles. So you would assume positivity of scalar curvature, positivity of the mean curvature, but for the angles instead of an inequality, Zhao Li assumed equality. There's also work by Wang, Xi, and Yu, which claims to 
both the conjecture and all dimensions without any extra assumptions. And this is subject to verification. Okay, so, so let me tell you about um, another result on this conjecture. So this is a result from a year ago, and it verifies the conjecture in all dimensions and for arbitrary polytopes, but under the stronger condition of equality of angles. So here are the assumptions. So suppose that we have a convex polytope in Rn. Let's assume we have a negative scalar curvature inside a polytope. Let's assume that the boundary mean curvature are negative. And finally, let's assume that the angles with respect to G are exactly equal to the corresponding angles computed with respect to the Euclidean metric. So then under these assumptions, the conclusion is that then the metric has to be flat. And furthermore, the boundary faces have to be totally geodesic, meaning that, um, I mean, first of all, Initially, we assume that in a negative mean curvature, but then the mean curvature is zero. But the mean curvature is the sum of the principal curvatures. And then the conclusion is that in this case, um, all the principal curvatures have to actually vanish, not just the sum. So it is extremely rigid. Okay, so, so, so let me give you an overview of the main steps involved in the argument. So I want to use here the Dirac operator approach. And it turns out that for the Dirac operator approach, there's a difference between the even and odd dimensional case. Um, however, it suffices to prove the statement with one of these because you can always reduce one to the other by taking a Cartesian product with an interval. So here, um, I want to consider the odd dimensional case that's more convenient for the spinner arguments. And if you happen to be in even dimensions, then what you would do is you would just consider the Cartesian product with the interval negative one to one, and then you reduce to the odd dimensional case one dimension higher. Okay, so now let's assume we are in odd dimensions. So then what I want to do is I want to solve a Dirac equation on the polytope with a certain boundary condition. Now, the problem is what you do about the singularities of the domain. And so one convenient way to get around the problem of singularities is to approximate the singular domain by smooth ones. So I take this polytope, and then I want to smooth out the edges and the corners and approximate my polytope by a sequence of smooth domains, um, which are also convex, so convex domains with smooth boundary. And so then instead of solving a PDE, a Dirac equation on the singular domain, I want to solve the Dirac equation on each of these <coughs> domains that approximate my polytope. Right. Now, in doing so, um, I have to give you an, a boundary condition. And so it turns out that what you should actually do is you should look at a tensor product of the spin bundle. So let's say um, we have this spin bundle. Let's say we call this S. So this is the spin bundle with respect to the metal G, and it comes with a, a connection and a, a home, and, and, and a bundle metric. And then I want to look at basically elements of the bundle where you look at homomorphisms from S to delta N. Well, delta N, this is the spinner space of flat space around. So this is just like a finite dimensional vector space. And then we look at homomorphisms basically from S to delta N. And so, so this delta N, this is a vector space and it's, it's very well understood. And its dimension is two to the integer power of N over two. And I will call that M in what follows. Right, um, another way of 
thinking of this is you can think of these elements as basically n tuples of spinners. And so then you have to impose a boundary condition. And the boundary condition is that is used here. This is an elliptic boundary condition in the sense of Lopatinsky Shapiro. So it's completely local. Um, I mean, there are many different boundary conditions that have been studied in the context of spinners and the Dirac operator. So, for example, another important one is the Atiyah Patodi Singer boundary condition, but this is not the one that's used here. So, roughly speaking, um, what you want to do with the Dirac equation is um, because the operator is of first order, you cannot impose a Dirichlet boundary condition. But what you can do is you can impose a condition where you fix sort of half of the boundary values. And in the Atiyah Patodi Singer boundary condition, this is done by breaking up the space of sections into eigenspaces of the boundary Dirac operator. And then basically you restrict to the eigenspaces um, corresponding to negative eigenvalues. Now here, it's, been that it's a complex bundle. That's correct. Um, so it's a Hermitian bundle, comes with a Hermitian metric. Now here, what you want to do is you want to take the spin bundle on the boundary and you can break it up, or rather you look at this homomorphism bundle, and then you break it up into two sub-bundles. And then the condition is that the restriction of your spinner to the boundary should lie in one of these two sub-bundles that define the splitting. So I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so this is a very classical boundary condition, but you can also be, look at it as a special case of a general framework developed by Bayer and Bauman, where they studied kind of the most general boundary conditions you can impose for Dirac type operators. And so in particular, these general results tell you that this Dirac operator subject to the appropriate boundary condition is Fretholm. And then you can compute the Fretholm index and you can do that in various ways. You can compute it using index theory or in, in that case you would use the holographic index law. And another way is in this case, you can also compute it directly using the formation invariance of the index. Um, Is it convenient for you to take the odd case? It's going to be a bit different here in the even case. Right? Yes, correct. So in the even case, the Breton zero. index is zero. And in the odd case, it's one. You want it to be one, is that it? I want it to be non-zero. So, so, so then once you know, so you compute the index in all dimensions, you find that it's one. And then once you know it's one, then you know the operator is non-trivial kernel. And then that means you can find a solution of the Dirac equation. Now, <clears throat> what this gives you is a solution of the Dirac equation on the approximating domain. So the picture would be... <clears throat> You have maybe your polytone like that, and you smooth out the edges and corners, and you approximate it by a smooth domain, and then solve the Dirac equation on this domain. And so then, the way you bring in the scalar curvature, this is a, a, a trick that has that that goes back to Lichnerovich. Does a a kind of Bochner formula, a Bochner Weizenberg formula for the Dirac operator. And then that brings in the scalar curvature. And then you can integrate that. And that leads to an integral formula involving the scalar curvature. And then in the final step, you pass to the limit. So you get an integral formula on each approximating domain. And then in the last step, you pass to the limit and then you have to show that the, the solutions of the Dirac operator on these approximating domains, that they actually converge to a useful limit. And then this limit will give you a spin-off with special properties. So this is a, a basic overview of what the, how the argument works. Now, let me make the various steps more precise. So first of all, 
let me tell you what the boundary problem looks like. And so let's assume we have an odd integer n. Let's assume we have this polytope sitting in Rn, and I call the boundary uh, sigma. And actually here, I assume that I've already smoothed out my polytope. So this discussion applies to the smoothed out domain on which I want to solve the PDE. So let's say, let's call this omega, and then the boundary will be a smooth hypersurface sigma. And now I also assume that I'm given a map n from this hypersurface to the n minus one dimensional unit sphere. Now, the, the way you should look at this map, you should view this map is in a model case, it would give you the Gauss map of sigma. So, in, so one possible choice of n is you could just define it to be the unit normal vector field to sigma, and then that gives you such a map. But this sigma, this n could be any map to the sphere as n minus one. Okay. You don't need it to go outside. No, I just need it on the boundary. So the map is what will give me the splitting on the boundary, and it will help me define the boundary condition. And so now for a section of the spin bundle, I cannot define the boundary condition. So I have to go to this, either this homomorphism bundle, or I need to express it in terms of m tuples of spinners. So I define M to be this, the dimension of this space of spinners. And then, I mean, if you want to make it explicit, you can look at these Dirac matrices, omega A. So these are M by M matrices indexed by an index A that runs from one to M. And they're like skew Hermitian, and they satisfy the Clifford relations that <clears throat> if you, take omega A, omega B, plus omega B, omega A, then you get minus twice delta AB times the identity. And so basically this, um, this dimension, two to the integer part of N over two, this comes up because this is kind of the, the smallest dimension where you can realize these Clifford relations in the class of n by n matrices. Okay, so then I introduce this bundle E, which is um, just a direct sum of m copies of S, or you can view it as a tensor product. And so then I want to define this boundary chirality. So that this boundary chirality, this is a map which takes, so it's a bundle map which takes the restriction of E to the boundary to itself. And so here's how it works. So let's say we take an M tuple of spinners, and then what I do is I multiply each spinner as beta by the unit normal. So here I use the Clifford multiplication with respect to the metric G. So mu is the normal with respect to G. And this dot represents the Clifford multiplication on the spinner bundle. And then what I do is I just take these linear combinations and the coefficients in these linear combinations that are given by these Dirac matrices and the components of the um, of the map n. So this maps into Sn minus one. So I can break it up into components. And here the EA, they are the like orthonormal vectors in the orthonormal basis, standard orthonormal basis on Rn. So essentially this chi, it acts by Clifford multiplication by the normal. And then you also do these linear combinations involving the Dirac matrices. Um, another way of looking at it is if you look at this homomorphism bundle, what you're really doing is you take a Clifford multiplication with mu on the space S, and you take a Clifford multiplication with the N on the space delta N. And for that, you need N to map into the sphere for that to have good properties. All right, so this is the, um, the boundary chirality. And so this turns out to be self-adjoint. And if you look at 
chi squared. That's the identity. And so that means you can break up the restriction of E to the normal bundle into the eigenspaces with eigenvalues plus and minus one. And then that gives you the splitting. And so then as your boundary condition, you can prescribe the condition that the boundary data lie in one of these eigenspaces. So here um, I require that the, bound, the restriction of S to the boundary lies in the plus one eigenspace. You could also take the minus one eigenspace and that would give you the dual boundary condition. So one important thing here to remember is that the operator is formally self-adjoint in the inside. But if you look at the actual operator between Hilbert spaces with the correct boundary condition, that's no longer self-adjoint because the boundary condition sort of destroys the self-adjointness. And if you were to look at the adjoint of this operator, then the operator in the inside would be the same, but on the boundary, the sign would flip. All right, now the model case to have in mind is the case when the metric G is the Euclidean metric and N is the Gauss map, the unit normal field. And so then in this case, um, there's an obvious solution of this boundary problem where you just take a set of like constant spin-offs on Rn and essentially the boundary condition, it's cooked up in this way exactly so that in the model case, there is a parallel spinner satisfying the boundary condition. So in a way, the boundary condition is reverse engineered from that condition that we want a parallel spinner as the solution of the boundary problem if we are in the model space. All right. Um, so far, you have absolutely not used this equal angle condition. That's correct. So up to this point, um, I'm just I'm looking at a smooth general, plane. general case. So I haven't talked about the approximation yet. It's everything is in the smooth category, and I haven't even used any curvature properties. Um, so the, the next step is to get the existence. And so this, this chi is itself a joint. You can break it up. You, can, you get the splitting into the eigenspaces. And then the crucial point from a technical point of view is that Clifford multiplication by tangential vectors anti-commutes with chi. So this is, the, I mean, this is like one line to check, but it is absolutely crucial because that gives you the electricity. So if you like compute a principal symbol and want to check electricity, that's what you have to check. All right, um, and so then it's elliptic in the sense of Lopatinsky Shapiro. And so now you, have, you want to, you know that it's a flat form operator, and now you want to compute the index. And I know three ways to do it. And so one, this is more general, and it would work even if it would work on arbitrary manifolds, not just like here where you have a domain in Euclidean space, and that uses a holographic index term, um, which goes back to Dan Fried and work of um, Christian Baer. Um, here, you can also do it in different ways. You can do it by reducing it to the, the Dirac equation to the the Ram complex, and then you can link it to the Euler characteristic of the boundary. Another way you can do it is you can just look at a model case, and in the model case, you can explicitly compute what the solutions are. And what you find is that in the model case, this constant spinner that I mentioned on the previous slide, this is um, in the kernel, but the kernel is spanned by this one thing, so it's one dimensional. And then if you look at a dual boundary condition with chi s equal to negative s, um, that would have trivial kernel in odd dimensions. And so then the index is one in the model case if the dimension is up. If you were to do the same in even dimensions, what you would find is that the kernel in the model case is again one dimensional, but a co-kernel would be one dimensional as well, and you would get index around. 
And so, so no matter what argument you use, then in all dimensions, you get positive index. And then the upshot is that if G is an arbitrary metric and N is homotopic to the Gauss map of sigma, then you can, use, you can solve the Dirac equation. And so this assumption that N is homotopic to the Gauss map, that's what allows you to compute the index because then you can deform it to the model case. Did you assume that N was homotopic to the Gauss map? Yes, so I, I haven't assumed it so far, but to compute the index, I need to assume it. The index might depend on the, what width. That's correct. Take. That's correct. So that's precisely right. So in the model case, when it's equal to the Gauss map, then the index is one. So then if you have any map homotopic to it, then it's still one. Now, in fact, it's what enters in the index is just the degree of the map. But and you can see that from the holographic index form. So that tells you basically that the index has to do with the degree of the map times the Euler characteristic of the sphere divided by two, basically. But here, I for the later application, I only need the special case when it's homotopic to the Gauss map, but it's true in greater generality. All right, so this finishes the first part, which is the existence of a solution on a smooth domain. Now, there are two more things to do. So the second step is um, to use this solution of this PDE in an integral formula. And then the last step is to pass to a limit and do the approximation. So let me tell you about the integral formula. So let's assume, first of all, that we have a completely arbitrary section of this bundle. So it doesn't have to satisfy any PDE or any boundary conditions so far. Then um, if, if you integrate this Bochner formula, you get the following uh, expression. And here I've estimated one term, so I only have an inequality, but I'm you can easily make it an equality, and then you have to write the term a little differently. But so on the left hand side, you get an the L2 norm squared of the covariant derivative of the spinner. Then there's the term involving the scalar curvature, so that's the usual thing. Then you get a boundary term involving the mean curvature. And this is this is not so surprising because the mean curvature is sort of the distributional version of the scalar curvature. So whenever you have positive scalar curvature in the inside, sort of the natural condition on the boundary that you want to pair that condition with is positivity of the mean curvature on the boundary. And then you get a bare term, a negative term, and that involves the norm of the n. And so this notation, uh, this refers to the trace norm. So let me define that. So this notation means the sum of the singular values of the n. And so the n dismantles the tangent space to sigma, which is equal with the metric g to the tangent space at n of x to the sphere. And on the sphere, you use the Euclidean metric and the description of the Euclidean metric. And so you look at these singular values, and then the sum of these gives you this trace norm. And this, this is kind of the bad term in the formula. So in the end, when you, as you apply this formula, you want to make the trace norm of the n as small as possible as you can. And, but while at the same time, keeping n topologically non-trivial so that you can apply the existence theory, the index theory. So uh, I understand yes. correctly. So the norm is the sum of the moduli of the eigenvalues of the second fundamental form? Is that what you're taking? So this n a priori is just a map. Now in the ah, model case, the model case. It, it would if you have a convex domain, then and you choose n to be the Gauss map, then then it would be the, then it would be exactly the mean curvature. So 
I think, yeah, that, so this is an important point that in a model case, when you have a convex domain in orange and you equip it with the standard Euclidean metric and you choose N to be the unit normal, then all these counts are zero if S is the solution of the PDB. Mm -hmm. So then H is equal to norm DN. Now let's turn to the other side of the inequality. So on the right hand side, you get the L2 norm square of the Dirac operator of S. And then you get two boundary terms. They look almost the same, but I mean, they're not the same complex conjugates because this is a Hermitian in our product. And this D sigma, this is the boundary Dirac operator, but this will not be important. But the important point is that you get here the difference S minus chi S, where chi is this boundary chirality. And so now the important point is that if we have a solution, um, of the Dirac equation together with the boundary condition that the restriction lies in the plus one eigenspace of chi, then all the terms on the right hand side are zero. And yeah, and this is consistent with the model case. So in particular, what this already tells you is that if you have a convex domain and you have a negative scalar curvature for some Riemannian metric, and you can find a map of non-zero degree such that H is bigger than the trace norm of the N at every point, then you get rigidity. Okay, so, so this gives you, this tells you what the correct rigidity statement should be in the smooth case. So now let's turn to polytopes. So the idea is um, that we want to think of this N basically as the Gauss map of the polytope. And so then on the boundary faces, where the map is constant, the condition that H is greater or equal to norm dN reduces to mean convexity. And then along the edges, H is kind of singular and dN is singular, and H being greater than norm dN should, morally speaking, reduce to an angle condition. And so that gives an intuitive justification for Gonoff's conjecture. So now here's how you can try to make that rigorous. So we need to smooth out the polytope. And so let's assume the polytope is just given in the usual way as an intersection of half spaces of this form where the UIs form a finite collection of linear functions. And then I will denote by Ni the unit normals. So they live in, the, in Sn minus one. And now you have many choices um, as to how you can smooth out your polytope. And it turns out that different smooth things are better adapted for different purposes. But for this um, result that I, I want to present, one convenient way is to, to replace the maximum of the UI by this sum of e to the lambda UI, where lam lambda is very large. So then if you look at this set where the sum of e to the lambda ui is less than or equal to one, then that gives a convex domain. It's contained in the interior of omega. As you vary the parameter lambda, you get a nested family of sets, and then eventually they exhaust the interior of omega. And importantly, for any given lambda, you get a nice smooth convex hypersurface. So this is a very like hands-on way of smoothing out a, a polytope. Now the idea is to use these Dirac operator techniques on omega lambda, but <coughs> to define the boundary condition, I also need this map n. And so the idea is in a model case, I want to define n to be the unit normal, but in general, I want to make a definition that's sort of modeled on that, but it's a little bit different. And so the idea is you first look at the unit normal field with respect to G and well, you can compute that very easily. I mean, it's a, basically you get a sum of, you, you get a linear combination of the gradients of these linear functions and you have to normalize it to length one. And here the norms and the gradients, they're all taken with respect to the Riemannian metric G. 
and then you can rewrite it and express it in terms of the um, normal vectors, the G normals. And here, the norms are with respect to G. And so then the way I define my N is I replace all the G normals by the Euclidean normals. And so this new, this would be a section of the normal bundle to sigma, but N is a map to Sn minus one, but the norm of the gradient of Ui, this would be computed with respect to the G metric. I mean, you could also use the Euclidean metric, but the G metric works better. So of course, the whole point of the definition is that in the special case when G is the Euclidean metric, then this N really is the more, more vector field and you get the Gauss map. Uh, sorry, is there yes. anything really hidden in the particular formula you're using or another reasonable smoothing would still do the job? That's a good question. So the, the, um, you could try a different smoothing. I think this is one of the simplest things that comes to mind. Um, there's another version of the thumb where you impose a different assumption. And for that, a different smoothing works much better. So it, I mean, the full conjecture of Gromov, I mean, this is still open at the moment. I mean, it depends on whether this paper by one G and U ultimately turns out to be correct. Are they using Dirac? Are they using the same scheme? So they use Dirac operators, but in the singular setting. And then that leads to various questions like whether the you can whether these operators of at home, how you define the spaces and there are a lot of intricacies involved in that. But other than that, in the, um there are all kinds of partial results. And in addition to the one I'm telling you today, there's another result where you have you assume inequality of angles, but you assume acute angles. And for that, you can prove it with a similar scheme, but you have to do the smoothing in a different way. So what I'm trying to say is there are different ways to do it. There's not one canonical way, and it depends on what you want to do with it. Right. Um, Just one question. Yes. Uh, if you do different smoothing, would you expect that in the limit you may get actually different solution? Because what they're doing is you're building spinners and then you're taking the approximation to be the similar thing. And you're saying, okay, there's a limit. That's Do you expect different limits by taking different approximations? Right, that's a good question. Um, in terms of taking the limit, well, there's this integral formula and I need the integral formula to pass to a limit. And the issue is whether you can control the boundary term. So if in order to take a limit, so I have, I need to make sure the boundary term is controlled. And then depending on the setting you are in, you can, I, I know how to do it, depending on the smoothing. So for different assumptions, I need to do the smoothing in a different way to set, to control the boundary term. Now, I mean, there's some overlap between the methods. And in that case, if you can do it in both ways, then I would absolutely expect that they would give you the same limit. Actually, I can prove that they give the same limit because you will get a parallel spin on and then it will be the same. All right. Um, yes, so, the, so let, let's keep in mind the definition of this N. And so it turns out this N, this is homotopic to the Gauss map. So the existence theory applies. And so in each let's say we have a sequence of approximating domains corresponding to a sequence of parameters lambda L going to infinity, then I get a sequence of solutions. And then I do the obvious thing. I plug them into the, the integral formula. And of course this N, this, I mean, this should really be an NL. It depends on like the sequence, um, but I'll suppress that in the notation. And if you, after you remove all the terms that are zero, you wind up with this inequality where you have a good term involving scalar curvature on the left and you have this H minus norm dn term on the right. And so let me give this a name, let me call this V. And then the big question is, um, is this V lambda L, is this no negative? If it's no negative, you're done. And so the first thing you might try is 
well, can you smooth out, assuming you have the angle condition, can you smooth out a polytope so that after smoothing, this quantity is no negative? And so for the smoothing that I told you about, I don't think this is true. Um, certainly, I cannot prove it. And for other smoothings that I tried, I couldn't prove it either. So maybe there's a way to do the smoothing that would give you this, that would be very elegant. Um, but I don't know, and at least at this point, it's not clear if such a smooth, such a such an approach is feasible. However, um, what you still expect is even if this doesn't have a good sign, even if this is not necessarily in a negative, you expect the negative part to be very small. So the dominant part sort of should have to do with the angles, and then you would expect this is small, the bad part. Okay, so now I need to tell you how to make this precise. So in the special case, when the angles are equal to those in the model's case, in that case, I can show that the error term, so the bad term, which is the negative part of this uh, v, that this is small in a Mori norm. And so, so the way a Mori norm works is it's basically an LP norm. Here I use sigma for the exponent. And then you take the L sigma norm of a ball and you multiply it with a certain power of the radius. And the power is negative to, so that on smaller balls, like you, you scale by a negative power of R. And I can show that the this Mori norm goes to zero as L goes to infinity. Now here, for this to be true, um, well, I can only prove that this is true assuming equality of the angles. And this has to do with the corners. So along edges, it's enough to have an inequality, but the corners are more subtle and that presents some difficulties. So here's roughly how, how you can do it. Um, so first, so, so basically the discussion breaks into these two cases. The first case is where, when lambda times r is bounded. So essentially the smoothing takes place on scales on the order of one over lambda. So lambda is huge. And so then, at a, so one over lambda is sort of the smoothing scale. And if r is comparable to that scale, then you can directly see that its potential has to do with the angles. And a priori, it's on the order of lambda, but then under the assumption on the angles, it's bounded by little o of lambda. And here, the equality of angles is used. Now, the second case is when lambda times r is much bigger than one, so you would look at much larger scales. And so then, basically, the scale you're looking at is much larger than the smoothing scale. And then there are like three cases. So you have to break it into three cases. The first region consists of points that are close to the faces, but stay away from the edges. And here you use the mean curvature assumption. The second region consists of points where you're close to an edge, but you stay away from the co-dimension three corners. And here you would use the angle assumption. And then the last region would correspond to points close to corners. And this set, this is very small, and it, it doesn't play a role when R is much bigger than one over lambda. However, it, does, it is important when R is comparable to one over lambda. But here, it doesn't really matter. In any case, um, this is a, a technical step, and what we need, the only thing we need to remember is that the this Mori norm of the error term is small. And so now let me tell you um, how to put everything together. So essentially I want to argue that because the error term is small in this Mori norm, then in my integral formula, the bad term can be controlled. And this is a subtle issue, but fortunately, um, this is, th th there's an, estimate in harmonic analysis due to Charlie Pfefferman and Duong Fong that it does exactly what we need here. So their original estimate was on Rn, 
for Schrodinger operator with a potential. And here you need a boundary version of that, but the adaptations are completely straightforward. So what their estimate tells you is that under the smallness of the morinon, you can show that this boundary integral of the potential times s squared. This is small compared to integral grad s squared plus integral s squared. Now, there's, um, of course, one point to, to, to keep in mind, which is that here we work on these smooth things and they, they become singular in the limit. And of course, this harmonic analysis estimates the work of in a random or in a half space. But this doesn't really matter because even though the domains degenerate, they are by Lipschitz equivalent to a ball with uniform constants. And this estimate, I mean, if you have two domains that are by Lipschitz, I mean, it has, they're basically the same for this estimate up to a factor. So even though the domains degenerate, the estimate holds in a, in a uniform fashion. There is no need to know that this uh, spinner is roughly of the same size everywhere, that it could be small somewhere and big elsewhere. This is, this is exactly the central point. So if I knew that the spinner was nice and sort of uniformly, so I should say the, if the norm of S square, the, let's think of this as the density of a measure. If this is uniformly spread out, then I don't need to worry about the corners and everything becomes much easier. But I have no idea how to ascertain that. And I don't know if it's, if we should even expect it to be true. And so basically this, this estimate of Pfefferman and Fong, th this is a very powerful tool that lets you deal with this error term, even if a priori this small mass square could vary by a huge factor. It's actually a very remarkable estimate. I mean, when you look at the proof, it uses like dyadic decompositions in an extremely clever way, very sophisticated estimate. Anyways, so then using this powerful tool, then you can put everything together. Here's the information you get from the integral formula. So the so grad s square, integral of grad s square plus a quarter r s square is bounded by this boundary integral, but then the estimate of Pfefferman and Fong tells me that the boundary term is bounded by little o of 1 times integral grad s squared plus little o of 1 times integral s squared. And so then in the special case that R is strictly positive, then you get a contradiction right away. And if R is merely in a negative, you have to work a little bit harder, but it's not very difficult. And then I mean, this is enough to extract the limit, and then the limit will give you a parallel spinner defined on the polytope, and then you can use the, and then you can use the boundary condition to show that in this tuple, M tuple, actually these um, spinners that are orthonormal at each point after scaling by a constant vector. And then it's easy to see that G is flat. And then the boundary condition will tell you that a boundary has to be totally geodesic. Yes, so maybe in the last minute, let, let me just tell you the statement of the estimate of Pfefferman and Fong because it's used in such a crucial way. So in, in their estimate, what you do, or, I mean, this is the adaptation to half spaces, um, you would fix an exponent sigma between one and n minus one. You would assume that you have a non-negative potential um, on the, defined on the boundary of a half space, which is bounded by one in this model norm. So here you integrate over cubes instead of balls. You can already see the dyadic decompositions um, that are used in the proof. And then you look at a function, a smooth function on the half space, and you look at its restriction to the boundary. And then you can bound the integral of the potential times f squared over the boundary in terms of an integral of grad f squared over the inside. And then that's like a lower order term. And yeah, so, so, so it's sort of like a 
And this H1 norm on the inside, this behaves like an H1 half norm on the boundary. So it's, you can think of it as an estimate like for fractional super life norm. All right, so I'm out of time, so I'll end here. Thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, I have a technical question in the previous slide. Uh, is that trivial to show that integral on the boundary of i i square is finite? Um, you mean the integral of yeah. s square? Oh, this is for every fixed L. So I'm not looking at, I'm not solving a PDE on a singular domain. What I do is I smooth out the domain, then I have a nice smooth domain. I solve the PDE on that domain, and then I get a nice smooth solution. But of course, it could go to infinity as uh, well. Lambda goes to infinity. Is that term bounded? Not a priori. I mean, in the end, it is, but only because of this estimate. Because then you can normalize, let's say, the H1 norm of SL to be one. And then you can like put these estimates together. And then in that way, you can conclude that integral grad SL goes to zero. And that's what allows you to take the limit. So you normalize on the bound. Um, so the, the way I actually normalize it, let, let me show you in the picture. So, so let's say I have my smoothings here, and then I look at a ball, a fixed ball inside these domains, so I have a whole sequence of smoothings, and I fix this ball, maybe you, and then I normalize so that the integral x squared over this thing is 1. But then, of course, the boundary integral could be huge. So a priori, it's not bounded. But, but if you combine these two estimates, the integral formula and the Pfefferman Fong estimate, then a posteriori, it is bounded. But a priori, it might not be bounded. Because you control the norm of the derivative, and then you can use Poincaré to control. Precisely. Right? That's okay. exactly how it works. How does Gromov verify? For the cube. Well, for, 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 cube. Oh, for cubes. So he reduced it to the Gehosh conjecture. So he reflected the cube and then basically reduced to a torus. And doesn't work for more general things? Well, for general, I think if, if you have a tessellation, if you can, th th then this type of argument works, but not for a general polytope. Any other questions? Thanks for coming in.